Welcome everyone. I would like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, July 12th, 2021. The time is 5.32. Due to public health concerns, this meeting will be accessible by calling the number that we've provided on our website, as well as the, the meeting ID number that we've provided. So you can view from uh, Zoom or from the meeting ID number by calling in. Comments are only allowed during the designated portion of this meeting. To speak during this meeting, press the raise your hand button near the bottom of your Zoom window or press star nine on your phone. Please refrain from raising your hand until the mayor has announced that he has opened up the public comment portion of the meeting. Your name or the last three digits of your phone number will be called out when it is your turn to speak. When using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. All speakers will have up to three minutes to speak. Uh, instead of speaking live, you may have submitted comments in writing by email before the meeting. Your comments must have been provided to our city clerk by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting today, and all written comments must be read within three minutes or less, including uh, included into the record, you must uh, state uh, your name and address. With that, I will uh, call the meeting to order with a roll call. Councilmember Aversol. Here. <coughs> Councilmember Denson. Here. Councilmember Franich. Here. Councilmember Himes. Here. Councilmember Markley. Here. Councilmember Rodenberg. Here. Councilmember Wook. Here. This is Mayor Kuhn. From staff, we have uh, city, Interim City Administrator Tony Pasecki. Here. In, interim City Clerk Josh Decker. Here. City Attorney Daniel Kinney. Here. Public Works Director Jeff Langhelm. Here. Police Chief Kelly Busey. I'm here. Finance Director Dave Rodenbach. Here. Thank you. And staff that um, is not on the agenda uh, that didn't need to be here was our, our HR Director, our IT Manager, our Court Administrator, Tourism Communications, and our Community Development Director. Is there anyone else that I have not called that is present of staff or council? Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, are there any, uh, any changes to the agenda tonight? We will proceed. Do I have a motion to approve our consent agenda? Move to I make a motion we accept the consent agenda. Councilmember Himes? Yeah. Councilmember Himes second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstain? Motion passes seven to zero. Our mayor's report tonight, I'd like to welcome, I'm pleased to welcome Tony Pasecki, who as our interim city administrator. Tony helped our city back in 2018 when I had been elected with several other council members. Tony was born in Nova Scotia, Canada, and he has a beautiful wife, Diane. Tony was uh, the city uh, Tony was with the city of Phoenix for 11 years prior to working for the city of Des Moines, where he was 20 years. 15 of those 20 were being the city administrator. He has been an interim city administrator for five years at various cities, and we welcome him back. So with that, I'd like to give a applaud to welcome Tony back. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to also mention that today, Today, our city is 75 years old. 
back in, I believe it was 46, back on July 12th of 1946, our city, Gig Harbor, was incorporated. So this is our 75th anniversary, and we're going to kind of kick that off tomorrow night with our summer concert series. So thank you. And that concludes the mayor's report. Uh, now it will be the city administrator's report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, just want to say I'm excited to be back here. And it's really nice to uh, see so many faces that I recognize. And to the new council members, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know you and to working with you. One other item I do want to mention is last Friday, I sent out our biweekly report that has three items in it. Uh, one of them is the CIP project update. And there was one little change in that I wanted to uh, call to your attention that I probably should have in the email I sent. If you look at the status update where all those dot points are that show all the actions that have been uh, taken on each project, you'll note that some of them have an action that is uh, uh, in bold and italicized letters. That is the, a, a new comment for that project. So if you don't see a, a something that's bold and italicized, it means there's no change to report on that project. And this will make it easier for you as you're going through rather than comparing one, the last week's version to th this week's version, the, the new information should jump right out at you. So I just wanted to point that out in case you hadn't noticed it. And that's my report, Your Honor. Thank you. Are there any comments? Um, now I will open up the uh, public comment period on non-agenda items. Uh, Tony, were there any non-agenda items uh, received as written? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I have one. Uh, it's from Mary Ellen Gilmore with the Jerkovich Pier LLC. She lives at 3525 Harborview Drive. Uh, and I'll read it as follows. <clears throat> Here's a statement from the Jerkovich family of Gig Harbor to the mayor and members of the city council. The Jerkovich family wishes to state how pleased we are that the long awaited dream of having a dock for kayakers, paddlers and others at Ansich Park is coming to fruition. We are delighted that our family's efforts to work with the city of Gig Harbor established a solution that is beneficial to all parties involved. The agreement that has been reached is saving the citizens of Gig Harbor many hundreds of thousands of dollars and we have kept the park view corridor open. Our family is part of the historic foundation of Gig Harbor having lived here for six generations. Throughout the city's history, we have tried to be generous to the community as citizens, helping with many foundations and organizations who share in Gig Harbor's commercial fishing legacy. We were happy to be able to work toward a solution at Ansage Park for all Gig Harbor paddlers, including the canoe and kayak team, and all human-powered watercraft boaters at our commercial fishing home port. Recently, the Peninsula Gateway ran an article that captured the enthusiasm for this project. It noted the pier has been in our family since 1901, under a lease from the Department of Natural Resources. Unfortunately, in reporting that our family is subleasing the canoe and kayak dock to the city for $1 a year, we feel the article left the impression that we would benefit by not having to make what the story called burdensome improvements to the dock float system. In fact, we did not consider them burdensome. We were actually in the process of getting them done. We had plans and a contractor add stoppers to the dock floats to protect the sea bottom. The implication was that we had offered a deal to get out of the new dock requirements. That is not true. As most of you know, discussions and plans for a paddler's dock have been going on for many years. At one point, the city asked if we would sell part of the pier, which we turned down because it has been in our family's fishing business since 1901. Eventually, it became clear to all that the best solution was to offer the city a sublease at a dollar a year. The city will do the dock stopper requirements as well as other improvements at its discretion. Finally, we felt the Gateway article left an impression this dock is for the sole use of the canoe and kayak team. In fact, it is legally designated for general public use, and this was an essential part of the agreement. We state emphatically that while we share and support the canoe and kayak team's excitement, the paddler's dock is to be for the use and enjoyment of all citizens. In summary, the Jerkovich family has always supported projects for the public good. The new Paddler's Dock will be a fantastic addition to our great, great way of life here. And we are very proud to support it and to be part of it. Thank you. And that is all, Your Honor. Thank you. Now I will open it up to uh, callers. Again, this is something that's not on the agenda. Just one moment while I get to the view of it. 
Uh, Good yes. evening, Mayor Kuhn. This is, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, go ahead. You have three minutes. Yeah, this is uh, Tom Swick, um, Hunt Street Northwest here in Gig Harbor. Um, I'd like to just say good evening to everybody. Um, this is a follow up to my um, public comment during the last city council meeting where um, Mayor Kuhn, you told me you were not privy to an outstanding public records request that had yet to been um, fulfilled. And so anyway, um, as you know, during that meeting, I had requested that, uh, or actually I communicated that I had requested that that be fulfilled by the end of the week. And I didn't receive any um, correspondence or records from Gig Harbor whatsoever. So anyway, in front of me, I'm looking at the email dated September 25th, 2020. It was sent at 4.38 p.m. And um, Kit, your email address was there. So was Tracy, Robin, Lee, Jenny, Bob, Spencer, Jim, and representatives from Pierce County, as well as the state as well. And um, also um, Jeff, um, excuse me, Mr. Langhelm and Mr. Ward and Ms. Knudsen and Mr. Larson. So again, I'm following up from the last city council meeting where you said you were not privy to this um, email or this public records request being outstanding. So um, I wanna read verbatim um, what the first two requests were. And I also did of course follow the Big Harbor's um, protocols and filled out the form appropriately and it was attached as an attachment. But the specific public records requests sought are um, a copy of the attached Gig Harbor request or public records form to include a copy of this email within which the public records um, sought are identified with specificity. And number two was please provide a copy of any and all, and those were in parentheses, communications exchanged between myself and all city of Big Harbor employees to include all elected officials. If attachments were included within exchange emails, please ensure they are also included. I also, of course, at the end of that, um, requested that these records be produced in a format and in a um, method that's deemed um, acceptable and customary for litigation purposes. And I asked for four separate distinct copies of those records to be burned to CDs. So anyway, I, as you know, well, you maybe didn't know this, Mayor Kuhn, but I didn't receive the records um, after the last city council meeting. But what I wanted to share with the community and members of the council and um, everybody that's present is that violations of the PRA, um, I just took a, a, we're going on 365 days as of September, which isn't too far around the corner. And I just took a low number, conservative number of 20 pages of public records at $200 per day equals $1.460 million in fines and penalties plus attorney's fees. Um, I've raised this issue numerous times over um, the last year, and it would take five to 10 minutes for Gig Harbor to produce these requested public records. It's a simple IT query. Um, I continue to wait for these records. Um, so anyway, I wanted to bring this up and I was glad to hear that this is being recorded this evening, just in case there's any issues with emails. Um, so I am respectfully requesting that the city um, produce those by the end of this week via certified mail signature required um, per the, um, my request. And I'm happy to pay any and all fees associated with that request. Um, okay, you have to wrap it up. So that's three and a half minutes. Okay, um, I, I would like to say also for the public records, uh, after after uh, the last council meeting, I did check into it, and I was uh, I actually had heard that we we did um, get the information for you as you requested, um, but that payment wasn't made in order to pay for those public records, which we are entitled to. So. I would like uh, Mr. Wick, if you would, um, if you would email our clerk um, and please copy Tony Pasecki and try to figure this out because after your last record, after your last uh, mention at it, I did check into it and the information was gathered and then uh, no payment was received for us to turn it over to you. So again, maybe there is some misunderstanding 
but if you would reach out to uh, Josh and uh, please copy Tony Pasecki and we'll get we'll get the misunderstanding figured out. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but it was almost four minutes and, and we have a time frame we all try to adhere to. Thank you. Are there any other people from the public that wish to comment? Okay. I will close the public record on non-agenda items. Our first item tonight is uh, new business. It's emergency water. Uh, how do you say that, Jeff? In in Turdy? Intertie. Intertie, of course. Uh, go, uh, Canderwood Boulevard Professional Services contract. Our report will be our public works director, Jeff Langhill. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, the proposed professional service contract before you this evening is the result of uh, a loss of a staff engineer earlier this year. The conceptual design and permitting of the Canterwood water main intertie project was originally performed back in March of this year and uh, the entire project design was originally intended to be completed by in-house staff by the end of this summer. but due to the loss of a staff engineer, we are now requesting um, the professional services contract you, you have before you tonight, along with the scope and fee from Corolla engineers to be approved. I do anticipate that the consultant will be completed with the design by the end of 2021. And we hope to be out to bid shortly thereafter for construction to begin in early 2022. And on a related note, um, about the project itself. On July 9th, the city did apply for a public works trust fund loan for this project from the public works board that was as directed by council. And we should be hearing back from the public works board on that loan application before the end of August. And therefore we can have discussions as we proceed into the 2022 budget on this project as a whole. With that, that's all my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't see any questions. Uh, with that, we will turn it over to uh, open up the public comment. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment on the emergency water intertie? Were there any written comments, Tony? No, Your Honor. Okay, I will open it up for a public comment on the callers. Okay, I will close the public comment on uh, new business item one and uh, clarify uh, council deliberation and action. Council member Franich. Uh, Mr. Langham, will this um, inner tie be connected to the city's water supply system or Peninsula Light and Washington Water? Well, Peninsula Light and Washington Water um, are very close together along Canterwood Boulevard, right near Baker Way. And what this inner tie will do is will extend the city's water system. Currently, it ends just north of St. Anthony's Hospital and connect it up Canterwood Boulevard north to Baker Way and connect with both uh, Peninsula Light Company and Washington Water Company and their water system. Uh, Council Member Franich, can you say that again? You're on mute. We will be tied into their system as well? Yes, it'll be a two-way inner tie, um, but just used for emergency purposes only. It's not going to be something where we keep the, the valves essentially open for normal operation. It will only be in case of emergency. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other uh, council questions or comments. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Okay, so it's a uh, move to authorize the mayor to execute a professional service contract to Carlo Engineering Inc. 
in an amount not to exceed $146,065. We had Mark lead the demotion. I believe it was Councilmember Wu, is that correct? That second it? All those in favor say aye. 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 Did you need me to read the full motion? I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, next time, that would be great. Okay. So, uh, opposed? Abstained? Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. The second item tonight is the resident residential lease agreement authorization of 7601 Soundview Drive. As we know, that's the fort, that's the house that the city owns just south of the Soundview Forest. Now, even though council had recently approved a uh, a lease with the tenants, uh, right, right when I told the tenant that we approved it, he said, oh, okay, but I bought a house. So, <laughs> so um, they bought a house and he said, thank you. So we, uh, we are under no obligation now to, um, with any tenant where it would be uncomfortable to jack up the rent to uh, what the market rate is. But one thing I was always excited about at this piece of property is the interest on uh, $2.1 million or $2.5 million over the life of the interest with the Hobb family was about $35,000. And I was looking forward to leasing the house one day to where we could get that money back from, that we spent on interest. And... Um, we are in the process of finishing up. We, we needed a month to uh, do some changes to the house. There's some asphalt that needs to be uh, fixed that's kind of beat up some, from some roots in front of the garage. We have to do some landscaping. We've done some tile work on the, on the shower. Uh, we're stretching the carpet in the basement. The carpet's in good shape. We did put laminate uh, flooring, uh, wood laminate flooring in the living room and dining room. It had thick shag carpet which is not in style right now anymore. And that was in the living room, dining room. So that's been done. So we're doing some minor changes and it appears as if we could probably get about $3,500 a month, but we wanna make sure that we're um, not doing too much because they do have to pay the excise tax and they do have to maintain the yard as well. So, you know, what we're trying to do, one thing I've done with my own rentals is I try to make it so that we rent the house when your, your, your leases happen when kids are out of school. So I, I found it advantageous not to try to lease a house when kids are still in school because you're losing uh, that audience. So I, I, I've always liked to do a lease where it's sometimes in the summer and it ends June 30th. So that who you're looking for could have kids. You're not gonna move kids in the, in the school year if, if you have a choice. So this lease would probably be from August till the following June 30th. And then we would be on a yearly basis. We wanna make sure that we can get a tenant pretty quickly so that we don't lose the August rent. So that's why we're asking council to, or researching what it would be worth for uh, the market rate, but we think it's around 3,000 or 35 going by other places uh, that are even a lot more and uh, the, Courtyard at Scancy, um, they're about $3,000 a month, the new rush projects. Now they're new, but they don't have any kind of view like this. And this has two bedrooms up, two bedrooms down, two and a half bath and a great view. Uh, so this would be authorizing the mayor to uh, set a lease with the tenant for a minimum of $3,000. Also, I don't, um, I don't want any one of the public or council to think that I'm uh, picking a certain person over someone else. So actually I have directed the city administrator, uh, unfortunately doesn't know a lot of people yet in Gig Harbor to be in charge of this. So he'll be the one that will be going through a credit check and he'll probably have public works and maybe Josh assist him. But Tony Pasecki will be the one in charge of figuring out who that new tenant was. But I do have several people that have reached out to me that's willing to pay uh, at least the rate that we're talking about. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, clarifying questions. 
Uh, Council Member Franich. Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you could briefly describe the process that will take place to select the renter. Um, uh, yeah, you know, first thing they have to go through the credit check and they would have to, we, we really, we can't, you know, we have to be unbiased, but uh, when people, we, we'd rather have someone long-term. So if someone wants to build a house and they're in the middle of building a house and they're only gonna be there one year, We'd rather have someone that's going to hopefully stay multiple years. So uh, we're going to be looking for someone that would, you know, you can't guarantee it, but stay multiple years. And then uh, they're going to have to be in charge of the landscaping. So I think it's, uh, I'll leave that up to Tony to answer that, but I think it would be finding the most qualified person, like anything. But I'll let Tony add to that. And Josh and I talked about it just a little bit. Um, try to find the appropriate places to advertise that the house is available. Uh, Craigslist obviously pops into mind, but there's probably two or three other places that we could uh, advertise it. And as the mayor said, we've already gotten interest from a couple people uh, who want to go and take a look at the house as soon as uh, we've got all of our work done. And we've got just a little minor bit of stuff left to do. So we think by the middle of the end of this week, uh, those two people go and take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> And then as the mayor said, we would uh, do a credit check to make sure uh, that this is someone who uh, will be able to pay the rent and uh, we'll move on from there. So it, it will be fairly advertised? Yes. Thank you. Council Member Jensen. Yes, I think this is an amazing property and a really great asset for this city. So I'm wondering before we get people in there, if council members would like to take a quick tour of the property, would that be possible? Because I'd love to see it. Sure. It's it's fun to see. And, you know, one I, I like this piece of property. That's why I was uh, involved too, but it's best to have Tony. But I, I, I want to show it to Tony this week. The laminate floor is in. It's actually got some really cute windows inside and... Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I could take council uh, Wednesday afternoon if they are if uh, just looking at schedules right now because you know it it comes fast. It's already Monday. <laughs> um, just one second. And now is the time when there's not a a renter in there. I could, you know, if people I know. Uh, Councilman Markley has shown interest as well. So there is Wednesday at noon or Wednesday afternoon at two. Um, what, what sounds good to council? Well, I'll probably have to do our little. So Josh, if we just go in and look at the house and turn around, do we still have to separate it for three and three? You couldn't have a quorum of council without advertising it okay. as a special council meeting. All right, so we could do um, we could do noon on Wednesday with uh, two with two or three, and then we could do that afternoon. Uh, could we do eleven thirty on Wednesday by any chance, Mayor? I've got a really heavy meeting that day. <laughs> At, for two hours, and that's the tail end of it. I could- um, yeah, Friday morning, maybe? Sure, we could do, uh, what about Thursday morning at nine? I can't do that either. I could do Friday morning. <laughs> okay. Um, can you do Friday at 11? Yes, sold. Okay. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's do that. So, um, Councilman Merdinson, um, Councilman Markley, would that work with you? Um, I would prefer the Wednesday or Thursday if okay. we're going to split it into groups. Sure. Um, do you want to uh, do noon on Wednesday or two o'clock on Wednesday? Um, noon would be great if that works for the other people that would like to go Wednesday. Okay, just a sec. What did what do we that works? Say? That Eleven works. Friday for me as well. I like to do Friday. Did we say eleven o'clock on Friday? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. We've got um, Denson Wook. Yep, I got Denson Wook. And then who else said Wednesday besides Markley? 
Me. Okay. I think Jim. Okay. And then other council, yes, council member Rodenberg. I'd like to do Friday. Okay. Um, okay. Are there any people that did not? We've got five so far. Uh, council member Himes. But oh, you're on mute. Wednesday, you still have any openings? Yep, noon. Noon? Oh, okay, noon Wednesday. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Aversol, do you want to see it at a separate time? You know, I, I could probably pass on it. I mean, okay. I'm curious about the building, but um, unless there's problems with it, I don't think it, it no. needs my attention. Well, thank you. That made it easier. Okay, so 11 a.m. on Friday, Councilmember Denson, Wook, and Rodenberg. There's a lot of parking there. We'll meet you there. Um, and it, it's a drive around. So just kind of park further around so we can all fit in. And then on noon on Wednesday will be Markley, Franich, and Heinz. Great. Okay. Um, any um, other questions? Yeah. Mayor? Yes. Uh, is it going to be, a, how many steps are there? Um, I, I, there might be like one or two, so we can okay. help you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we'll help you on that for sure. Okay. Um, any other, any other clarifying questions from council? Okay, I will open it up to the public comment. Were there any written comments uh, on the new business item two, Tony? No, your honor. Okay. I will now turn to the callers and um, please state your name and address and you have three minutes. Uh, Mr. or Mrs. Miller, go ahead. Um, Levi, uh, Levi Miller, uh, I just had a question about um, my gun rights. I, I'm sorry, um, this is a, this is a council bill on uh, council bill number two and it's on the agenda and i apologize but we actually already opened up the public comment on items that were not on the agenda so that would have been the time to talk about something that's not on the agenda so, so I, it's at the beginning of the meeting next time then sure sure also um if you wanted to call our chief uh kelly Busey. Uh, on gun rights, I'm sure you would be happy because the public comment is really not so much for asking questions, it's for stating an opinion that you have on something. So if you wanted to reach out to our chief, Kelly Busey, uh, he would be happy to uh, return your call or talk to you. Do you have a number? I do. Okay. It's 253-853-2500. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Any other callers that wish to comment on, on this agenda item? Okay, I will close the public comment and uh, council deliberation and action. Council member Franish. Move to authorize the mayor to execute a one-year lease agreement for the house at 7601 Sam U Drive with the minimum monthly rent of 3,000 plus leaseholder excise tax per a monthly rent of 3,000 plus leaseholder excise tax. Second. Okay, all those in, uh, I think we already did, deli uh, any other deliberation? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, motion passes. And now we have a staff report uh, from our 2020 crime statistics report from our chief Kelly Busey. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm hoping you can see my screen. Somebody give me a positive yep. on that. Okay, good enough. So uh, good evening. This is our annual look at our uh, previous year of crime statistics, both within the state and the city and how they relate. So uh, you may be familiar with the format of this, but I'll work our way through this. 
as a refresher, uh, crimes, of course, are punishable by incarceration. So this report doesn't speak to traffic tickets or criminal traffic citations, something like these are crimes that uh, uh, somebody could actually go to jail for. Uh, the data is collected through a, a report writing system that our officers use. It's adjusted by our staff here on site and submitted to South Sound 911, where they compile all of the data for all of the agencies in Pierce County. And the report is uh, then published by the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs based on a, a standardized national incident-based reporting system so that every police department in the country is reporting their crime activity the same way we can compare. The crimes are separated into Group A and Group B. Group A are the more serious offenses, uh, the ones we think of on violent felonies and, and the big thefts and weapons uh, crimes, things like that. Those are further divided into crimes against persons, crimes against property, and crimes against society. So Group A offenses are the crimes that are reported, whether we identify a su suspect or not. Those are the uh, crimes that citizens can report or our officers uh, see occur in their presence. Group B offenses are actual arrests. These are times we make contact with the suspect and make a, a arrest on them. Usually they're on view arrests by, by our officers. First, a look at the state crime profile. Uh, crime was up this year, 7.1% uh, throughout the state. Crimes against persons were down, property way up. Property crimes skyrocketed statewide. And then crimes against society were down slightly. Uh, group A offenses were cleared by arrest across the state 22% of the time. So almost a quarter of the time one of those offenses was committed, there was an arrest. Um, that number will be significant here in a moment. Just to more of interest, there were 302 murders statewide. That was a lot, up 46% in 2020 versus the previous year. And over 2,000 assaults against police officers, that was up about 6.2%, of course, with two uh, officers killed in the line of duty. As far as Gig Harbor, the crimes against persons, remember the Group A offenses, crimes against persons, uh, all look pretty good to us. Uh, we, of course, focus right in on the uh, assaults, however, and try to figure out why, why is that happening? And we see it can be directly correlated to what we see as a rise in domestic violence totals. Uh, unfortunately, during the COVID event, we saw a spike in those. So assaults were up, everything else looked to be pretty healthy and down. Crimes against property, again, our biggest problem in Gig Harbor, crimes against property. Um, burglary jumped off the chart at me right away, and I had to think about that for a moment. Why was burglary uh, so high? And it turns out that uh, a lot of these were prior shoplifters. So when somebody shoplifts from a store, we can arrest them, give them a citation and a court date. We also issue them a trespass admonishment. So if they come back and commit a similar crime, that's now a burglary. So some of those crimes were captured in this total. And then fraud offenses were up fairly notably, uh, but that was due to the employment security fraud that hit the state last year. So we took a lot of those reports. And then crimes against society, we saw a lot of drug equipment violations, almost always of the 14 reported in 2020. Those are gonna be heroin users who have just paraphernalia left over by the time we intervene. We get called often to uh, people slumped behind the wheel of a car, for instance, who've just overdosed on heroin. So uh, the paraphernalia is all that's left there. Those will all but go away next year. And, and I'll talk about some of the law changes at the end of this presentation. So a statewide profile, crimes against persons are, make up about 20% of the crimes statewide. Within Gig Harbor, we're about half of that. I'm glad to see that. So our violent crimes and our assaults and crimes against people are down compared to the state about half. So when you add up all of our numbers for 2020, uh, we were down 2.2%, the second year in a row that our crime rate has gone down. Remember, again, statewide, it went up about 7.1%. Our crime rate per thousand, uh, 75.3. Uh, again, this is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, so in Gig Harbor, 75.3 crimes per thousand uh, was down about five uh, from 2019, but our population increased. So uh, quick, quickly though, the state average was about 65%. Remember that's a lot of unincorporated area and uh, similarly Pierce County, although their crime rate uh, did rise just slightly. When we look at our crime rate though, it's compared per thousand population. So 
75.3 puts us up against, uh, in this position, compared to all the other agencies within Pierce County, again, the state average of 65.3. Well, Gig Harbor doesn't feel like we have a lot more crime than some of these other cities. And uh, the explanation for that is that we grow so much during the day. We know that a lot of business influx, a lot of employment, hospital, things like that. So uh, we're dealing with uh, crimes of a city that's a little bit larger. So our actual population at the time that this report was prepared was just over 11,000. If we adjust the numbers to just equal the state average, and I submit that we're actually a little bit less than that, uh, it would be like servicing a population of a city about almost 13,000 people in size, if that makes sense. This was encouraging the uh, trend for our group A crimes, again, those serious crimes over time has diminished. Uh, again, in 2018, we're a bit less staffed than we are right now. Uh, we can't draw that complete correlation there, but uh, that is of note. But overall, our crime rate uh, has gone down for the second year in a row. I'm very pleased with that. Our clearance rate, remember the state average clears their cases about 22% of the time. We were at about 31% of the time. And quite frankly, we were shocked that it was that low because we do a very good job of, of clearing all of our, our cases. But then we remembered a lot of our current open cases are sitting in a pile in the uh, Superior Court Prosecutor's Office right now waiting to be charged. They can't be charged, of course, until the jails open up a little bit more. We can't prosecute people for, say, motor vehicle theft, a crime that wasn't bookable during COVID, uh, because there's no place to put it. We can't put them in jail right now. So once those cases start getting charged at the prosecutor's level, we expect our uh, clearance rate to go way up. So 328 total arrests during 2020 for our city. So the group, group B offenses, again, are what we can kind of call the uh, lesser offenses, mostly misdemeanors. And these are based on arrests. Our DUIs were down 25 this year, uh, probably a little less than half. But remember, bars were closed at 10 p.m. during COVID, right? If at all, they're, if it open at all. Uh, and again, some of these were on view arrests too. Property crimes, we recovered almost a quarter million dollars worth of uh, stolen property, which I think is pretty healthy for our city. And then drug offenses, heroin is king. Uh, we knew that would happen years ago. It was marijuana, but those crime, those, those issues have been decriminalized and heroin is really taking over. And as we know, heroin is related to a lot of our uh, other theft offenses. So our takeaways from this that our crime rate is down 2.2%, even though it's up statewide. Our on-view arrests were down. We can attribute a lot of that to COVID. Uh, most of those would be group B offenses uh, normally. A lot of stores were closed and stuff early on in COVID. Crime is cyclical. We can't get caught up in numbers, right? As population of the city increases, our crime rate will go down correspondingly, if that makes sense. If we're doing our job and keeping maybe even just a flat crime rate or number of crimes, the crime rate will go down as our populations increase. And uh, notably, drug arrests will decrease a lot next year. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, theft, uh, retail theft in particular, and vehicle prowls are kind of our most common crime. Uh, the case clearance rate is going to get even better, and I explained that with some of the cases being stockpiled at the prosecutor's office. So our, our city seems to be servicing a much larger daytime population with that daily influx, so we're doing our best to keep a lid on, on those crimes. I'm going to take a moment and talk about some of the new legislation that passed this session that's going to really change our police services. And I think members of the public uh, may not be aware of a lot of this, and it's going to uh, have some repercussions. And I'll go through these very quickly, but the, one of the more notable ones is what we call the Blake decision. There was a notable Supreme Court case that essentially made drug possession hard to prosecute. Drug possession is still illegal, but uh, what we can do with the offenders has changed. In other words, the first two times we come in contact with someone who's in possession of drugs, we can't arrest them. We have to refer them to treatment services, of which there's a, a big void, of course, uh, countywide and statewide. This amounts to us handing them a business card with some re referral phone numbers and saying, please get yourself some help. And then we have to be able to track those two referrals. Well, if we're dealing with somebody from Kitsap County, maybe they've been contacted one or two times. We don't know that. We don't have a common database that holds all of that stuff. So drug crimes are gonna go way down, if you will, I think drug possession is actually going to go up. 
Uh, pursuits, vehicle pursuits uh, are severely limited. Our uh, existing pursuit policy is very strict anyway, but a notable change here is that before we can chase anybody, we have to have probable cause that a crime has been committed by somebody in that car. So put into practice, if we're on our way to the scene of a violent crime and we see the suspect vehicle leaving, we can't even chase it until we have information, firsthand information, from the scene to develop probable cause to arrest somebody in that vehicle. Uh, the examples of this just go on and on, uh, a big source of frustration. So I think a hastily written law there. Electronic recording of interviews now, when we, ever, when we interview an adult who's in custody, and by the way, custody could be the backseat of a patrol car. If we interview an adult for any felony, that has to be recorded. Uh, if we interview a juvenile, for any crime, misdemeanor or felony, that has to be recorded. Um, so it's a good thing we're ahead of the curve with body cams. This is actually the legislators putting uh, a, a, a body camera requirement on police departments without having to pay for it. Juveniles now have to have uh, access to attorneys. I think this law takes effect uh, January 1st. So if we stop and question a kid even on a minor shoplift, we have to put them in contact with an attorney before we can even talk to them. You, a lot of big changes in use of force. Uh, we can only use force now in four instances, okay? Very limited. We have to basically have probable cause to arrest them. They have to have escaped from a facility or there has to be imminent threat, and that term is defined, of threat or bodily injury. So we can't even intervene to prevent some lesser crimes. And the biggest void of all in these new laws, I think, is that they neglected uh, mental health. Uh, if we're dealing with somebody who's experienced a crisis and uh, out of control, we can't really touch them, uh, even if they, we have uh, grounds for an involuntary commit. So I hope some of these things get corrected in the next legislative session, but uh, even amongst the chiefs within Pierce County, we're all scratching our heads and consulting with legal advisors on how to respond in policy to these new changes because they're, they're quite drastic. So with that, I will field any questions. I see some hands are raised. I don't know what order, maybe the mayor kept track of that and can call on council members. Sure, just one second. Yes, we would start with uh, Council Member Aversol. Yeah, Chief, uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, my question, I guess, is, and maybe you can answer this, maybe you can't. Do we know if it's our citizenry that is committing most of the crimes in our community, especially with the theft, or is it are we being preyed upon by outsiders? I didn't do an analysis of that in 2020. I have in prior years, and overwhelmingly, it's people from outside of the city. Thank you. Yes, uh, Council Member Markley. Um, I think Council Member Franich and Rodenberg were before me. Council Member Franich, sorry about that. Uh, I, can you keep flipping through the slides, uh, Chief, and I'll stop you on the one I had a question about. There you go. Okay. So is that uh, under the, in quotation marks, crime rate, um, does that take into consideration the A and the B category or what, what is the? Uh, a good question, Council Member Fransch. This is uh, uh, group A offenses only. Okay. So um, those were the more serious ones. Could you That's go correct. back to that, please? Those are your most, some of your group A offenses as an example. Okay, so is, and then could you please, I'm sorry, could you please go forward now? Sure. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more, please. So is the, what is the difference between um, burglary and it, where, where does shoplifting, what, what classification is shoplifting? 
Shoplifting is a theft or larceny unless, uh, as I explained earlier, unless we have previously arrested that person in that store for shoplifting and we've issued them a trespass admonishment, meaning if you come back here again and steal, you've come into the building with an intent to commit a crime, that will be a burglary. Burglary, okay. as we normally think of it, is somebody breaking into a building, but it also does include that definition of a return shoplifter. Okay, and, and what, what is classified as a robbery? Robbery is when you're taking somebody, something from somebody by force. Okay, so th that those that's the difference between the two, the three. Right, and a lot of people confuse those, so that's a good question. Uh, and then one more slide forward. I, I was trying to keep track of where we were here. Um, keep going, please. One more. Um, one more. There you go. Um, so do all the, under crime, all, all these other jurisdictions, I'm assuming have the same definition for uh, is, is you're using as far as class A and B or, or category A and B? Right, that's a national standard. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, Council Member Markley. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Chief BSC, for this presentation. And um, I'm so sorry for what you guys are about to have to go through. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, how many of the things that you updated us on as far as changes came from House Bill 1054? A lot. Um, there were two significant bills, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, well, actually, I have them right in front of me. 1054 ad addressed a lot of police tactics, uh, mm -hmm. things we can carry, things we can do, things we can pursue. Uh, the other significant uh, bill out of the last session was Bill 1310, which was use of force. Was that a House bill or Senate bill? I can't remember. Um, they were both House bills. Yes. Both House bills. Mm -hmm. Thir okay, so 1054 and 1310. So just so the just so the public knows, um, you can go to ledge leg wa gov and click on bill information on the left, and you can type in any of these bill numbers so that you can see the whole bill amendments that were made to it, the whole process of what the bill went through. Not only is it fascinating, but it's really educational to see how and when things were amended, who approved what, because if you have the same concerns that a lot of people have about these bills, you can then go and see specifically what happened and how that bill got passed. And then you can go and write your legislators, speak out at the next legisl legislative session and make your voice be heard if you're not happy with these, um, with these things that are going to greatly impact our community. So, um, I would just encourage the public to look those bills up, read through them, and um, educate yourself on these things because some of these seemed real sneaky and kind of flew in under the radar, I think, from what a lot of us were expecting them to be. And so um, that's going to impact our community greatly. And if you think it won't affect you personally, it will. So we need to really be vigilant when we're in our legislative sessions as citizens to look at what is being proposed and look at what's being passed and how this will affect us as individuals, as a city, as a community, um, and, and really work hard to make sure that the right people are being protected and the wrong ones are gonna have opportunity for justice. Let's just put it that way. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Busey, for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Markley. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rodenberg. Yeah, I, I have a couple things. Uh, that may have been under the radar to the public, uh, Councilwoman Markley, but it was not under the radar to the legislators. Uh, and as far as if you've read any of the uh, comments that have been made, the Washington State Sheriff's and Chief Police Chiefs Association actually told the legislator exactly what the results would be if this legislation passed. So knowingly that they still passed it. Uh, so on this exact uh, slide you have up right now, Chief, 
uh, the 75.3 crimes per thousand. Is that uh, considered at the Gig Harbor uh, daytime population or the nighttime population? That's our sleeping population. That's the 11,240. Okay. Did you, uh, just for the heck of it, since it's not really recordable, did you happen to do the math and see what it would have been had you uh, done the daytime population? I did not do that. It would be that significantly would be, lower. <laughs> that would that would be very interesting because to be above the red line looks like we're above the state average when right. we're really not. Yeah, and the are, other, we we are right. we are dealing with daytime crimes uh, in, in our retail centers. You know, some of our big stores, um, and uh, my data is quite old now, so I hate to keep throwing it out. But in 2010, the U.S. Census came out and and said that uh, Gig Harbor grows by 88% during the day. So we almost double in size. Right. So, and then the other question is, uh, even though the drug possession is still illegal, but when you hand them the business card and you ask them to get a, a, an offender to get help, uh, you do still confiscate the drugs? We do. It's still contraband. Yeah. Okay. That's all. And thank you very much for the job you do, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Wook. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chief Busey, for this presentation. Thank you for keeping crime at bay here in Gig Harbor. <laughs> and this evening on our consent agenda, I noticed that we did uh, pass uh, um, we did pass the money for a new police officer, a lateral change or shift into our department, I believe. So um, thanks to everyone who voted for this. Um, and are you going to be making a presentation about this new officer at some point in time? I will, yes. I can't uh, speak too much about it yet because we don't have a signed uh, employment letter yet. But yes, I, I'm thrilled that uh, we have a, a candidate on the table who's just finished his background process and uh, hopefully you'll be able to meet him very soon. And will this bring us to 21? It will not, it'll bring us to 20. All right, so we still have one more we need to find. That's correct, yeah. Police hiring is very hard right now <laughs> for many reasons, some of which you can imagine. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hines. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation tonight. And uh, thank you for your article in the Gateway. Uh, my wife read it and uh, she was uh, taken aback, called, oh my gosh, our legislators did what? Uh, I think we ought to build off of that, uh, that opportunity to uh, make our citizens aware of uh, some of the things that uh, you're gonna be trying to deal with this year as a result of their legislation. And in some areas, uh, what can we do to reverse those, those decisions that they made last year? So uh, again, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll keep up the fight. I'm, I think it's great. Thank you, Council Member Hines. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief, for that presentation. Uh, we all very much appreciate it. Our Thank whole you. community does. Thank you. Uh, council reports and comments. Uh, Planning and Building Committee uh, will uh, meeting on July 5th. Uh, council Member Hines. Uh, yes, uh, we did meet on July 5th and uh, we continued our discussion of the items leading up to the Vision 2050 approval. Um, the billable lands report status report uh, was presented. Uh, and by the way, the county actually has the master buildable lands report and they work in concert with our staff to come to an agreed understanding of the assumptions that lead to the buildable lands uh, as, as specified. By the way, we're talking residential, we're talking commercial and we're talking public use. Uh, the major uh, categories that those things go into. Um, the buildable lands, as we understand it right now, at least preliminarily, it looks like we, we should, <laughs> I got to watch what I say, we should be able to meet uh, what we believe our target will be for Vision 2050 on the residents and uh, dwelling side. And this is due to one, the buildable lands, but the second thing is staff has managed to get a, an improvement in the 
density of people per dwelling. Right now we're at 1.8 uh, residents per dwelling. And that's driven, to be quite honest, by we retirees uh, based on the number of new families with kids they've managed to push that number up to 2.2 people per dwelling. So if you do the math, it says you can meet your population target with fewer number of dwellings, okay? So that's, that's helped uh, quite a bit. Um, under the countywide planning policies discussion, which I brought to the meeting with the PCRC report, um, that has been an ongoing process, and I'd say it's a lot of it's wordsmithing, but there is some some content in there that's worthy of note. Uh, I think I mentioned once before the inclusion of climate change as a, an item in Vision 2050 and making it a responsibility of municipalities. Okay, this has not been well received by the uh, participants of the PCRC, myself included, called, there's no staff that goes with this at all. And we don't have any climate change scientists on our staff, nor do we believe that we'll ever have any. So there's a lot more coming on that one. Um, the, uh, the other item in that, and, and this is wordsmithing at, its, at an extreme, uh, we got into a significant debate on should versus would, or should versus shall, I'm sorry, in the wording of the county policy, which is where this is all heading for. And that is, is this something that municipalities should be striving for, or is this something we're gonna hold you accountable for? Okay, in other words, one is a very firm objective, the other one is, yeah, you ought to be striving for it, but if certain things arise, yeah, maybe maybe we'll cut you some slack. That's going to that's gonna be probably the number one item that's going to continue on this one. The last item we covered was the employment target. We also have an employment target as part of Vision 2050. We will have an employment target. Um, this was just an introduction to this. And again, we are... Uh, somewhat uh, novel in that our daytime uh, population of inflow of people, mainly employed related, uh, exceeds our residents. So uh, it's a kind of an interesting situation. We shouldn't have any problem with that. Um, the last part of discussion we had was on the, um, an existing, it's not even an issue, it's more of an advisory type thing. And that was the special use permit that we approved for the, the COVID relief discussions, particularly this is on outdoor um, uh, activities. And uh, staff took us through a status of that. And basically it's, it's uh, uh, they are responding, they've, they've had single digit um, uh, complaints, if you wanna call it that, mainly resolving around noise and lights uh, they've been able to talk to the people who submitted those and they've gotten pretty good responses back that, yeah, it, one, it's a temporary thing. Two, colder weather is coming and this, this will inherently uh, drop the, the, the frequency of these kind of things. So the, uh, the current situation is uh, steady as she goes and this thing will resolve itself hopefully and it will not blow up into something big. So anyway, that's it for the uh, Planning and Building Committee. Thank you, Council Member Himes. Uh, the Park Commission uh, meeting of July 7th, Council Member Abersold. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Parks Commission meeting July 7th. Minutes were approved. Uh, we had a short agenda. On the agenda, we talked about the pros plan uh, we reviewed that and talked about its scope. Uh, we got an oper operational tasks update, um, most likely from Jeff Langhelm. And then we uh, briefly discussed the Parks Appreciation Day. Uh, and again, we're gonna be bringing that to you, I believe in spring. And then uh, many of the Parks Commissioners felt that they wanted to get this uh, 
expression uh, about the park manager uh, position uh, on the website is not there. Uh, there is significant concern from the parks commissioners uh, that their staff, uh, the vacancy puts um, undue duress on the city staff. And uh, then we adjourn and that concludes our meeting. Thank you. And our Parks and Commission Canada Review Committee uh, meeting of uh, today, July 12th, Council Member Aversol. Yes, yeah, so that was the Boards, Commissions and Canada Review Committee. Um, we had five participants, two for the Design Review Board and three for the Parks Commission. Uh, at the start of the meeting, uh, the Design Review Board Chair, Brett Marlowe, expressed the desire to get more landscapers on board with parks or the design review board. And so we, um, I, I believe staff kind of took that ask uh, you know, under their wings and is going to be incorporating that into the website uh, when we asked for uh, volunteers. But we were able to uh, interview Tom Brown for the design review board and also uh, for the parks commission Mike Kiley, uh, Peter Barker, and William Appleton, and the uh, my fellow members decided that William Appleton would be the person that they were going to recommend for the Parks Commission. And that concludes my uh, passing along of information for the Parks Commission, our Boards Commission Candidate Review Committee. Thank you. Thank you. I've emailed you that we're going to meet this week at the house. I've already emailed you an invitation. Uh, Council Member Wu. Yes, thank you. I assume that we're at Council Comments now. Correct. And um, on behalf of myself, I just want to say thank you to the Jerkovich family. It is due to the generosity of that family that our community's paddler dock is coming to fruition in a timely manner. So thank you. The fact is the Jerkovich family did not need to work with the city, but they did. That family did a kind and generous and thoughtful thing for everyone who will enjoy using that float area and the community dock. The Jerkovich family saved the city money, saved the city time, and is going to make users very happy. As far as I'm concerned, every person who uses this area owes the Jerkovich family a grant of gratitude. So I'd like to thank them here. Um, also, I would like to request that at our next um, city, council Mabel, uh, city Council meeting of July the 26th that we have an update on the honoring project. Um, so I, I would just like to have an update on that from someone in the city administration. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see, where do you go? Is uh, Jeff still with us? There you are. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking for the names. Um, maybe uh, we actually pro you could probably, um, after the rest of the council comments, we could actually, you could probably just give an update if that's okay with you tonight, because um, we can. Yeah, yeah, I could give a brief update after council comments. Okay. That's fine. Sure, sure. Um, council member Franich. Well, uh, thank you for that, Council Member Wu. She she covered uh, most of the things that I was going to say. Um, as far as what in relation to thanking the Jerkovich family, um, the one other thing that I don't think she mentioned that was uh, very important <clears throat> to me, and I think will be for the rest of the community, is the preservation of View Corridor. So um, I wholeheartedly agree with Council Member uh, Wu's comments on that. So I will leave it at that. Um, my other uh, comment would be on under new business one, page 18 of 18, which is exhibit um, B. Um, is there any way, uh, Mayor, that, and it, it just seems to, it's just a chronic problem. This is the fee schedule that it, it always comes along with, um, consultants contracts and it never fails that this page is always the hardest page to read so um, in the future if you could have staff please um, make this so it's a little more legible I would appreciate it on all the 
consultant contract uh, scope and fee charge like this? Right. I, I just rolled my eyes because I looked at the fonts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, that's pretty small. So, um, so would that be uh, the water? Yeah, the water intake. Okay, so um, Josh, if you would just put out an email to uh, department heads just to make sure that when they include things in the packet, if they have to break it into a couple pages to make it large enough to, uh, to, to be able to read without, you know, super, super uh, mag magnified glasses, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I had one, I'll, I'll let uh, council member Aversol go. I had, I had one other thing and I didn't write it down. So I'm trying to remember what it was. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get back to you. Council member Aversol. I just want to uh, point out that I've been um, looking at our post office lobby for the last couple of nights and it is just a terrible mess down there and something needs to be done. Uh, trashes are overflowing. There's paper all over the floor. The floors are covered in some, some form of liquid. I don't know what it is uh, and needs to be seriously mopped. And it's just, it's just disgraceful. Our citizenry uh, does not deserve what we're getting from our post office and uh, thank God it's not our city that's doing that to us, but uh, someone needs to reach out to the post office and get something done because it's just disgusting. It's unhygienic and I feel bad for anyone who has to go in there. Right. right. So Josh, would you, uh, would you uh, get a letter written that I can send? Uh, I saw it Friday. I've never seen it worse. It was it was really really a pig pen. The bins were all full, and they, well, they, actually they weren't all full, and they still were. The paper was all over the place, and it's it's a disgrace. I would have to agree with you very much. So I think we need to we need to send it to the postmaster, and then we need to send it to the headquarters in Denver, and tell them what we really think about it. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. So. Um, uh, Josh or Tony, let's make sure we don't forget about that this week. Sounds great. I made a note about it. Thanks. Uh, Council Member Franich. Yes, thank you. Um, and I don't know if this is uh, the appropriate time to, to get into a long discussion about this, and maybe it can happen in the future. But, um, you know, we all have received over the last year many emails from, from residents complaining about uh, people speeding through town. And, um, you know, I know council member Wook has, has talked about, you know, calming measures and, and what have you in different areas. And that may be, may, may help the solution, but um, I, I would just like to implore to Chief Busey that I think maybe we need to uh, have our officers be spending a little more time um, pulling people over for speeding. I mean, it, you know, it's the summer. So uh, yeah, I think everybody knows I live on Harborview Drive. So um, I, I've got a um, front row seat to what is happening here. Um, you know, I know there's a lady on Soundview that, that was on top of this last year. We got a lot of emails. Um, you know, in, in the old days, Gig Harbor was known as a speed trap town. And um, I'm not saying I want to necessarily go back to those days, but the, 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 we, we need to get some emphasis patrol done on, on the speeding that's going on because it is, uh, especially later at night, uh, I mean, and, and I'm the first one to say because, you know, we've done many speed, not many, but we've done a handful of speed studies from people complaining in their neighborhoods. And usually those speed studies come back showing that there really isn't too big of a problem. But um, I don't know if we maybe could, maybe Chief Busey, if we can get, uh, do a speed study on Harborview here, get the, the, um, the, the counters out. But uh, it just seems to me that there has really been a increase of uh, people going considerably over the, the posted speed limit. So. Any comments you'd have of that, uh, I would appreciate. 
Well, uh, you're correct. Even when I first started here, there was very little to do except run traffic enforcement and uh, times have changed quite a bit. So uh, I look forward to additional staffing to address those problems even more. I think that our speed signs that we move around town and collect data have helped us a bit too. And um, I can work with Public Works to uh, do an actual speed study. They're the ones with the equipment for that. So. Through time, we are proposing more crosswalks, and uh, I, I just talked to Jeff today about you know doing a crosswalk in 2022 at Hunt and Soundview, so where Reed Road and Hunt come together. Um, it's very hard to cross the street there. There's uh, there's bus stops there, and there's only a crosswalk at the top and the bottom, so um, that has to be that will actually be looked at this fall. And so hopefully some things like that will help calm it as well. But I agree, well, I agree that, with you. That, that is, you know, unless there's somebody that's uh, operating the, the flashing lights to slow them down. And, you know, speed calming measures only go so far. I think I probably said the story before, but um, I had relatives on Raft Island. They put in speed bumps. And I'd go over there and I'd go, you know, I respect my cars, so I go over them very slow. But uh, the majority of the people that I witnessed, they just, they, it doesn't even phase them. They just fly over the speed bumps. I mean, there needs to be a penalty associated with the speeding. So um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that for tonight. Thank you all very much. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rodenberg. Yeah, this is further to the uh, same discussion. Uh, in the last month, we did receive a lot of, uh, all of us, including the chief, uh, received a lot of letters from uh, residents in the area of North Harbor View and Burn Hartson. And the police department responded very well because on Burn Hartson, uh, three days last week, there was a patrol call car park there uh, just by City Park. And I think Councilman Denson lives exactly on that corner. She probably saw them as well. So uh, it worked and we can't, uh, we can't have those everywhere with the staffing levels we have. But I can tell you, uh, it's not like the department is ignoring these requests we get uh, from the public. So uh, good job, Chief. In fact, I called the Chief and I told him uh, that I had, had seen that car out there and, and uh, I started paying a little bit more attention to my own speed. So thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Rodenberg. Okay, we have announcements of upcoming. Uh, I'm sorry. Any other any other council comments? Okay, uh, oh, Jeff. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, there. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Wilk. I know I just almost uh, go ahead, uh, Councilmember Franich. Was that going to be what you were going to ask? Okay, go ahead, Jeff. If you want to give a a report, I know one of our citizens had emailed Ginny, so it'd be great for Ginny to be able to tell tell the citizen as well as other people too. Sure. Uh, there are many things in motion for the Austin Honoring Art. Uh, as Council knows, uh, we have the art in our possession right now. It's being stored at a city facility. Uh, we have been able to successfully submit a complete application to the planning division on the uh, land use application for the art at the location originally proposed. Now that the shoreline master program amendment has uh, gone through its process and been approved. Uh, we were deemed complete uh, last week and now the, um, the planning division is going to, that's in the queue for the planning division so we'll go through their process uh, and then consecutively we're getting ready to bring on board or actually amend an existing contract with the structural engineer who are going to be, be designing the base for the artwork. And so as the land use process moves forward, we're gonna be going through the design and building permit process for the base. And so we anticipate as shown on the last CIP schedule we provided, we anticipate we're gonna be hopefully by the end of September, uh, awarding a contract for construction of the base and being done with that uh, construction, uh, hopefully in November. Great, thank you. And around the same time, we will, uh, once that happens around the same time, we're going to be showing the, the um, steps that council had 
given us the go ahead on honoring the, the Native Americans. So I've already ordered a sign that says Austin Park at Tualica uh, Estuary. And that's been ordered to replace the existing sign there. And then when you walk about 10 or 20 feet in, there will actually be a, a voice box where you can push one of four buttons that will actually have the Native Americans uh, saying uh, Tualacut and uh, Squababish and be talking about uh, the, the village and the Native American name. And that will be four different buttons that you push for about 30 seconds. And then tomorrow at 10 till noon, uh, some citizens are going to be presenting to the Art Commission uh, history of the Native Americans in Gig Harbor uh, for, um, for the Art Commission on the pilings. So, and that's tomorrow at 10 to noon. I'm sorry, that's, yeah, that's Wednesday from 10 till noon. And you can see that and you're more than welcome to go to that Zoom meeting too. So we're, I think all that's kind of coming together even though it's taking some time. Uh, Council Member Wu. Yes, thank you. So I, I appreciate this uh, update tonight. I would still like to have an update in uh, August or at the last meeting here on the 26th or the first meeting in August um, or at least by the first meeting in August. So uh, hopefully that we can get this, uh, continue on with this for our communities who's very interested in this project. So thank you. Sure, so do you want, for the people that may, maybe didn't know about it, that's why you want the same update again? Well, hopefully in, a, in two weeks time or four weeks time, there'll be a little different update. But yeah, I do wanna have a, an update because we have a lot of people in this community that really is interested in this project. And so I think it'd be nice to be able to update everyone at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, we've got announcement of upcoming meetings. We have a public works committee meeting on Tuesday, tomorrow, July 13th at 3 p.m. I believe that was canceled. Okay, is that canceled, uh, Josh? It's on my... Yeah, I think that one was canceled. Okay. Yeah, it, it was still on when we put the agenda together, but it has now been canceled. Okay. We had an inter... Governmental Affairs Committee meet special meeting on Monday, July 19th at 4 p.m. Great, and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second by Council Member Abersold. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.